this morning I preached on the rapture and we have enough young Christians and new people in the church they really weren't able to discern the difference between the rapture and the second coming prior to uh, this morning. And for those of you who have heard these things many times, I hope that you'll want a church that sings them over and over again to me. And if we don't repeat often what we believe, what we believe will fall by the wayside. And so we want each young generation, each new sets of people, new people come in to come to a full knowledge of the faith, don't we? And uh, so tonight I want to speak more uh, about the new world order. Uh, this is the deep state or the invisible power behind the governments of the world, behind the United Nations, and uh, these are, these are antichrists, but they're not the antichrist. They're God-haters that truly rule the rulers of this world. I think that even Donald Trump, as connected as he has been to the nations of the world and the business of the world and the banking concerns of the world had no clue how big the deep state was. I think he's starting to get a clue, but he still doesn't know. There's a certain naivety about him. But Bible believers and Bible students know in verse 3, the son of perdition is none other than the Antichrist. While he personally does not arrive on the scene until the middle of the tribulation period, the complete failure of the new world order precedes him and opens the door for him. The new world order is energized by the spirit of Antichrist. The Bible teaches that the spirit of Antichrist will be around for a good number of years, long before the Antichrist comes along. And we can see that there is a spirit of Antichrist that pervades every society and is pervading uh, American society more and more and more. The spirit of Antichrist. The attitude of Antichrist. And yet, the Antichrist, other than using the New World Order's failure to open the door for him, has no further use for the New World Order. He's letting people on to believe that which is not true, that which they cannot accomplish, and he knows, all of hell knows, that the new world order will be a dismal failure. I'll get into that more than just a minute. But the new world order, as it is right now, are unified in their thirst for world power and their power over you. They do not want you to have a say-so in anything, but they want you to think that you have a say-so. You don't have to be a blind American to know that elected officials have surprisingly little say about what's going on in America. The IRS would tell a senator to buzz off. The World Bank would tell a congressman to buzz off. And all of these, these uh, organizations and departments that set law, and, and we have no say so, and those are not elected officials. They rule. They rule. But God lets them for right now. 
He's not intimidated by them. There are four things they wish they could achieve the new world order tomorrow. But God is restraining them. Waiting for the divine appointed time. But from a physical discussion here, there are four things that stand in the way of the new world order from becoming a total reality. Number one, the sovereignty of nations stand in the way, along with their national currencies. This they must get rid of. Worldwide, the sovereignty of nations, and they've already done it in the European economic community or the, the European Union. Uh, they were reminding us this week that uh, they have no borders, they can choose a country uh, of their liking and go move there. They don't have to become a citizen because sovereignty doesn't exist in the EU. Sovereignty stands in the way and they are aggressively destroying or attempting to destroy it in what few places it exists still in the world. Christianity, along with the moral values, stand in the way. Here's one that may surprise you, and I've heard some, some preaching uh, that bothers me a little bit and some teachings that somehow uh, that Islam is a part of the final world rule, and people, that is not true. Islamic kingdoms, along with their absolute monarchies, and their stand against homosexuality and other rigid religious beliefs, they are the enemies of the Antichrist. He's got to get rid of them and their monarchies, and guess what's happening right now? You look all over the, uh, the Middle East, and the monarchies are crumbling. Even Saudi Arabia is in serious trouble tonight. Not only in the royal family rule, but their currency, their economy, and they're among the strongest. Iran is another strong one, but they're in trouble tonight. But you look at all the other little Islamic uh, uh, republics and it's nothing but crumbling, nothing but war, nothing but murder, nothing but rioting, nothing but killing each other every single week. I'm going to tell you what. I'm going to step out on a limb and, 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 uh, and, and there are people in here going to hate me for this statement. I don't know what we're doing in Syria. We don't even know who our enemy is. And the people we have teamed up with are our enemies. Every group in Syria hates our guts. Do you understand that? I don't know, maybe there's an advantage if we just help them kill each other off. Syria is done for. Afghanistan is done for. Yemen's done for. Kuwait is done for. Turkey's close to being done for. The Islamic kingdoms, along with their absolute monarchies, are a threat to the goals of the Antichrist and the New World Order. China along with their quest to rule the world, is another big obstacle to the new world order. When it's all said and done, the new world order really will real, rule only the ten original confederations of the Roman Empire. They'll never subjugate China. They'll never subjugate Russia. 
And this is another message. I've said it before. The Antichrist has to obliterate three threatening world powers before he can take power. And there is a reason why the United States of America is never mentioned in the tribulation. Four things stand in their way right now. That's what they're actively today, tonight, this week, trying to destroy. The sovereignty of nations. The sovereignty of the United States. They do not hate Donald Trump because he's obnoxious. He is. They don't hate him because he's rich. He is. They don't hate him because he's non-compliant. They hate him because he's trying to rebuild the sovereignty and the self-government and the military mightiness of the United States of America. He is standing in their way. None of that, which they tried to destroy in the previous presidency, None of that is what they can afford. Do I think he's a man of God? Absolutely not. Do I think he's God's man? Yes, I do believe that. There's a difference. Donald Trump is not a man of God. I'm sorry. He might be saved. I'm not, I'm not uh, to judge him. There's only one judge. But if you're talking about a man of God, no, that he is not. But he is God's man because I think God put him there to hold off the new world order because God's calendar and God's timing is perfect and you're not going to rush God. And just maybe he's buying American Christians a little bit more time to get God's work done. So in that way, I think he's God's man. I don't think he's a man of God. Four things char characterize the present efforts of the New World Order. The destruction of Jesus Christ, the Bible, and Bible believers. We see that. Of course, Jesus Christ stands in the way of the Antichrist and the New World Order. Number two, the destruction of nations who refuse to give up their sovereignty, which I said, and this is how they do that. They destroy patriotism. Do you realize that there was a day in most of your lifetime, not that long ago, and you were not a child, where the patriotism of every European nation was strong? If you were Polish, you, were, you had a patriotic heart for Poland, especially with the invasion of Hitler. If you were Hungarian, you were Hungarian. If you were French, you were French. And in, since World War II to now, that patriotism has been destroyed and substituted with a loyal to, loyalty to the European economic community. They don't care about French citizenship so much as world citizenship. We had that French fellow, I got his name written down here, I'll get to it later, who said not three weeks ago, that sovereignty of any nation is the enemy of the world. That's what he said. That's what he said. But you know what? In every nation, there's still people that want to be sovereign, still love their country. All of a sudden, uh, the new uh, uh, fashion in France is yellow. 
They call them yellow jackets. They don't know what to do with them. They thought they had obliterated them. Every single weekend, and yesterday too, they demonstrate, they demonstrate, they demonstrate by the thousands. They want to be French again. They destroy patriotism, number one, by rewriting national histories. That is taking place in, in our educational system today, here in America. Rewriting national histories and by shredding national pride. They are trying to force the New World Order and the deep state here in America are trying to force us into bankruptcy because that holds hands with sovereignty. So they sp spend countries into oblivion, crushing nations unto the resulting under the resulting debt load. The unfettered and out of control immigration resulting in the death of nationalism is another part of the New World Order strategy. I'm not talking about just the Mexico border. Those borders are gone in Europe. Now they've started on us. They don't exist, except for China and Russia. That's all. They are working on the destruction of the family unit through the destruction of sexual identity, traditional marriage, morality, and parental authority. Finally, they try to destroy the rule of law so that they can substitute their own. May I say this? They believe in themselves they really come this short of believing in their own deity. Their wisdom is far beyond yours. You don't know a thing. The ruling elite class of the New World Order believe they know more than everybody else in the whole world and that we cannot create a decent world outside of their genius. They really think that of themselves. Yet the New World Order will end up in massive failure. And this is unknown to them now. Unknown to those who are part of the New World Order and unknown to the rulers and unknown to these invisible people that rule. Their failure has been designed in hell. And that is, their failure is by hell's design. They have put all these crazy ideas into them, knowing it will fail. Don't you understand? They are opening the door to the Antichrist. And when this failure is complete, they will scream for one man to save them from themselves. We're looking at a total collapse of civilization in the tribulation period. We're looking at a total collapse of world war, of, of world peace, excuse me, during the tribulation. A total collapse of the world bank during the tribulation period. A total collapse of food distribution systems. There'll be bread lines where they'll be able to buy bread for pennies, the Bible says. Massive famine around the world, massive. The total collapse of world governments, the total collapse of education. At that point, the world and those in cahoots with, but for sure, the ten federated nations of the, of the Roman Empire, which is today's EEC, European Union, will cry out for someone to step forward on the world scene to save humanity from themselves. 
they will know they have destroyed civilization. And they will cry out, save us from what we have done to ourselves. But who will they cry out for? Not French President Emmanuel Jean Michael Frederick Marco. He's dodging tomatoes right now. Not Vladimir Putin, who can ride a horse with his shirt off. Not going to be him. Not Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who knows how to dance on top of a table. Not going to be her. Not Elizabeth Warren, who is overwhelmingly Native American. Not pretty boy Beto O'Rourke. He just spends too much time in front of the mirror. Not Kim, Kim Jong-un, who's never ever looked in the mirror at his hairstyle. He couldn't have. Not Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She's too old and already senile. So who will step forward? One is going to step forward and he will rise up out of the sea from hell. He is the son of perdition, the epitome of the darkest evil ever. The Bible says he has no desire for women. And I'm here to tell you that homosexuality tonight flies in the face of the image of God like nothing else on earth. And the Antichrist champions that cause when he takes power. But the spirit of Antichrist has been driving that forward already, hasn't it? I ask you tonight, how is the world, New World Order agenda progressing? Sovereign nations have crumbled under the might of the New World Order and are still crumbling. Sovereign nations are now in a minority. The European Union is near collapse already. And it's not even the tribulation yet. African nations are near total collapse. Middle East nations are at war. Saudi Arabia is close to bankruptcy. I ask you tonight, how is the world, new world agenda coming along? The deep state is so big that Trump doesn't even come close to understanding how big it is. When will the Antichrist come to power? Actually, in the middle of the seven years. Daniel 8.23 says he will come in the latter time, or sometime during Daniel's 70th week, but prior to the times of the Antichrist, there will be a great falling away first, which has already started. Three things describe the destruction of humanity. The return of the great violence of Noah's day. Matthew 24, 36, we will return to the days of Noah. If you go back to Genesis, the days of Noah were characterized by violence. This is we're going to get back to it. But wait a minute, that's not the word we have for wars. It's the word we use for no personal respect for life. We can criticize all we want of all the beheadings we've seen on TV. No respect for life while we kill our own babies. In Jude 1, 6-8, not only are we uh, returning to the days of Noah, no respect for life, but the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. Jude 1, 6-8. 
And of course, generally speaking, marked increase in wars and rumors of wars. Some say that the Antichrist will come from the Vatican. The last pope says that that's where he's going to come from. Not this present one. But he was wrong. He said, after the Roman church is raptured. Okay, I'm listening. You've got to be saved to be raptured, but I'm listening to the man. Uh, Jack Van Impey was interviewing the previous pope. And uh, Jack Van Impey was pointing to the scriptures that the Antichrist uh, first headquarters will be the Vatican. And uh, uh, the Pope says, you are correct. He says, it will be, the Antichrist will be an apostate Pope. That's what he said. After true believers, uh, uh, we true believers are raptured. That's what he said. Okay, I'm listening. The one that took his place, the present pope, is a reprobate. I mean, not just theologically, he's, he's a reprobate. He's destroying Catholic doctrine. Not that it should, is worth preserving, but he's destroying it. He's, he's apostate even to uh, Catholic theologians. <clears throat> but he's or even his one to follow him is, is, not, is not the Antichrist. There are eschatological theologians within the Catholic Church that, sense, that says Francis will be the last pope before the return of Christ. He is a transitional apostate. He's not the pope but he does occupy the Vatican. The Antichrist does. We know where all these popes came from. We know where the Vatican got them from. We know their home countries. But they're not the Antichrist. The Antichrist will rule from the Vatican for a short period of time, in the second half of the seven-year tribulation, but his time there is relatively short. Because the Bible says he looks to the east and realizes that there are 200 million men, uh, Chinese and, and, and kings of the east uh, coming to take over the world. He says, oh, wait, wait, wait. And he moves his headquarters to Jerusalem. He's going to stop them. He's going to amass the forces of Europe on one side of the Valley of Megiddo as these millions, 200 million, 200 million, million millions come to fight. He will not come out of the World Council of Churches, though they will pay homage to him at that time. But Revelation chapter 13, verse 1, is absolutely clear. He arises up out of the sea. Out of the sea? Yeah, what do you think is below that? Where is hell, by the way? The center of the earth. Not just because we know the core is hot, but the Bible says that hell is in the center of the earth. That's another message. God literally opens the gates of hell. And one of the first things he will do, and you don't hear this text very often, is the Antichrist will destroy the Islamic kingdoms. Listen to this in Daniel. These are the descendants of Ishmael. Daniel 11:40 And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him 
and the king of the north and shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. He shall enter also into the glorious land. Many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape, but he shall have power over the treasures of gold of, and of silver and over the precious things of Egypt and the Libyans and the Ethiopians will be at his steps. But tidings out of the east, out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go forth with great fury, fury to destroy and to utterly to make, away, uh, to make away many. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the sea and in the glorious mountain. Yet he shall come uh, to his end and none shall help him. Speaking of the descendants of Ishmael. By the time the Antichrist takes full power in the middle of the tribulation, the Islamic kingdoms either will have been overthrown or will be overthrown immediately. We are the first generation to see the beginnings of the end in the Middle East. The first generation to see it. They're being destroyed in front of our very eyes. And that destruction will be completed by the middle of the tribulation. But here's the good news tonight we close with. The rapture will happen, the rapture will happen right on time as we said this morning. Jesus will catch us up in the air, removing us out of harm's way. When Jesus comes to reward his servants, whether it be noon or night, faithful to him will he find us watching with our lamps all trimmed and bright. Oh, can we say, are we ready, brother? Ready for the soul's bright home? Say, will he find you and me still watching, waiting and waiting, waiting, waiting when the Lord shall come? There is no doubt in my mind that when the rapture happens, an overwhelming number of Christians will not be watching their spiritual lives will be in no condition to stand before the Bema Seat. They aren't looking for him. They're not ready for them. And they will carry a lot of sin baggage with them. But oh, will they be relieved that that sin baggage was taken care of at Calvary. That's right. Praise God. Praise God. But it, the song, the hymn, poses a, a very mind-searching question. Will he find you watching? Will he find you waiting? Will he find you ready for the Lord's return? Four things, I just want to mention them tonight. This is what you and I need to be doing between now and then. Number one, stay focused. Don't let the cares of this world sidetrack you and get you unfocused. There's all kinds of things out there, including technologies, that can take your focus and your mind away. Even your smartphone can do that. Stay focused. Whatever it takes, as a Christian, stay focused. Number two, stay vigilant. 
The devil's got your number. Stay vigilant. He walketh around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Number three, stay in church. This is God's program in the New Testament. It's the only program in the New Testament. And finally, stay on the team. This church takes a team effort. And the ministry takes a team effort. Don't quit serving. Get busy. Stay on the team. And before three and a half years before the Antichrist ever comes up from the sea, we're out of here. We won't even be around to see that happen. You will not see day number one of the tribulation period, not even day number one. You know, God could have put us all the way through uh, the tribulation period and made us uh, suffer, and then when he comes back, set up, and then we could just rule with him. That's another message altogether. I'm not going to get into that tonight, but I'm going to tell you what, you are the recipient of more of God's grace than you'll ever be able to comprehend until you get to heaven. God will spare us from so much. Yet, that does not mean we will not see difficult times, times of persecution. Often I pray, Lord, be with those precious saints in the Middle East who are losing their heads by the sword every week of the year. It's just not in the press. God help them. And from what I've seen, God's grace has been sufficient for them. I've only heard one live, I've only observed one live video of a beheading and the translator translating the video and the executioner demanding that they deny their faith and deny Christianity and the interpreter uh, interprets the one on his knees and he said, how can I deny Christ who has done so much for me? Wow. There's some amazing brethren over there and sisters and teenagers. I've read about teenagers who would rather go to prison the rest of their life than to deny their Christian faith. We read one about one this past 24 months in Pakistan. And the government, uh, the governments of the world were able to secure her release, but every day they arrest and abuse Christian girls. So stay focused. Let's stay focused. All of us, let's stay focused. Let's do it together. Let's pray for each other. Let's encourage each other. Let God do all the judging. Let's just us do all the encouraging. Hmm. And God help us to walk more worthily of our Lord. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for tonight. The word which has...